the, the pictures there give the story that the world is used to hearing. That the German army invaded the consequence for Belgium was immediately horrendous, that there was tremendous concerns of, about famine and hunger, not without good reason. That the Americans stepped in, and a, a very wonderful American, in particular called Herbert Hoover, organised on their behalf, through great works of charity, vast sums of money to supply and look after the poor of Belgium. But this amazing group were so sufficiently wealthy, well-off and supplied that great ships could freely and with the permission of the Allied governments come into Rotterdam and the end product was that the orphans of Belgium were saved. None of that is untrue. That is true. That did happen. But my contention is that what it has become is a screen behind which other matters were going on. I need to, you to allow me to, to, to digress here for two or three minutes. The first book that my colleague Jim McGregor and I are responsible for is called Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War. It was uh, published in, in uh, July 2013. And we talked about it at the Edinburgh International Book Festival that year. Now, our book, which has caused considerable uh, comment, that is in the wrong place, our book was very much influenced by this gentleman, Professor Carol Quigley, from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, an eminent American professor very close to the American establishment. In fact, there, there's good reason, and it has been said he, he was in the CIA. I don't know. Just let it be said. Let it hang there. He wrote an extremely important book called The Anglo-American Establishment, in which he said, here I'm going to share with you the names, the lists, all the connections of the elite of the financial, of the uh, political, of the aristocratic and banking elite of Britain who are actually the decision makers and who, whose foreign policy, whose foreign policy the government followed. Now, uh, uh, sorry, if, if your mind thinks this is crazy, I should go now. I understand. The first time that Jim gave me the book, and it is a difficult book to read, because it is pages and pages and pages of names. You'd have better fun with, you know, the Litany of the Saints or something like that, I promise you. But inside it is an incredibly rich body of knowledge. And what Quigley, now, Quigley is very important. Quigley was the professor from uh, Georgetown in Washington who had the huge impact of all people on Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton thanked him publicly on the night when he was given the, the, the Democratic uh, presidency, candid the candidacy for the Democratic president presidential race uh, in Washington. He is unquestionably an excellent writer. But even he, and indeed especially he, was afraid of the content of in this book. It was not published in his lifetime. You can still get copies of it. And in fact, I, I certainly published, uh, sorry, published, I certainly purchased um, a copy through Amazon. And I think there is an e-book as well. But it's not an easy read. Because this litany of names goes on and on. But what he was saying was that British foreign policy had a hidden control. And he named this group, and his challenge, the challenge that Jim and I took up, was follow the clues. See what these people did. Look how they acted together. And in a way, 
That's the gist of a book. Now I tell you this to a purpose. It is very relevant to the manner in which we came to understand what was going on behind the scenes with the Belgian Relief Committee. Unfortunately, that possibly is too far for you to, to see. We, we constructed almost a, a metro map to establish who these people were, what they controlled. But uh, if you buy the book, by the way, it's on page 200. And, uh, well, OK, it's worth, it's worth the try. It's worth the try. The key thing is inside British politics, whether it be Conservative or Liberal, and this is a time in the age of Asquith's government in uh, 1906 to the start of the war and beyond, 1916. These people, from the king himself, through hugely important industrialists like Lord Rothschild, Lord Isher, I think that won't be a name that you know, Cecil Rhodes, um, and, and other some names that you'll know, some that you won't. The most important, a name that I doubt if anyone in this room will have heard, Alfred Milner. I hadn't heard of him. I had no understanding whatsoever of my own history, and I've only got a joint degree in it. Perhaps it's the, the fault of the University of Edinburgh. I don't know. I have never heard of Alfred Milner. He has been whitewashed from history. So important was he. So influential. And his name is going to come up yet again. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you this because it is... You're going to have to take in a lot here and, and look at me and, and think, no, he's not escaped from the weekend from the madhouse. I am telling you, I'm trying to share with you something which is often difficult to believe. And if you go away and, and have to think about it, great. In 1917, for the last two years of the war, this man that you'd never heard of and I'd never heard of was... The number two in David Lloyd George's government in Britain. He was unelected. The number two, he was in the war cabinet of four. And yet, I'd never heard of him. I doubt if any of you have. Why? That's a worthy question. I won't address it, but it's a worthy question. Okay, from this group... I want to say that we were researching this group and the links with the army, the former office, uh, the Oxford University in teaching. We were looking at them and their, their connections, are very strong connections that grew uh, in, to the United States through banking, the control of banking, to Africa and the control of the press. That is a circumstance within which we were researching Initially, the whole, the years 19, um, 95 to 1919 was the in, initial objective. A publisher said, no, stop at 1914. You've got so much on the causes of the war. So we did. We have since been working on, uh, on the, the, the second part to, to complete the entire story. Now, why is this important? First of all, here is our man, Alfred Milner. The man who can rightly say caused two wars. He admitted he was responsible for the Boer War. He goaded the, the Boers into actually making the first move. He was a clubber, very dedicated, very educated, very respected Englishman. Beside him are a whole a band of, of brothers who went on in the First World War. This is Hamilton, who was responsible for Gallipoli. This is Roberts, who was the real army power in Britain. Um, I can't remember this chap's name, but he ended up as the Tsar's military attaché. Up there, we have um, General Wilson, responsible for the liaison with the French in the years immediately before the war. This was a very powerful group, and sitting in the middle of them, exerting his influence, was our good friend, Lord Milner. 
But as we researched, without making any attempt, I, I promise you, the only thing I knew about Herbert Hoover was that he was the 31st president of America, and that was handy because it sometimes came up in pub quizzes. I knew nothing else about him, his background, but he kept coming into our narrative. He helped Alfred Milner in South Africa when, after the Boer War, they needed, desperately needed, labour for the gold mines. And where did they get them? They got them from China. And who was it that organised, whose company organised all these poor people to come to South Africa and fill the labour mines in, in, in the mines? Herbert Hoover. James. Herbert Hoover. I must remember that name. He was Sir Edward Grey. Probably a name well known to you. Edward Grey, Foreign Secretary. A man for whom I have a great deal of disregard. Um, <laughs> Edward Grey. Edward Grey. How can Edward Grey know Herbert Hoover? I was flabbergasted when I found a letter where Hoover received, which Hoover received from Grey, asking if he could borrow his motor car in June 1914. Come on, how well do you need to know anybody in 2014 before you ask them if they could borrow their motor car? A hundred years ago, how well did you? This set alarm bells ringing. This is Lord Eustace Percy, interesting character, very, one of the foreign office minions who's totally and completely linked to the British aristocracy. Don't know too much about him for the very simple reason that all records, all of his papers, all of his stuff burned. Interesting. Richard Haldane. Richard Haldane was the Secretary of State for War. How did Hoover know Richard Haldane? It's a very interesting question. You see, Hoover, much beloved of the Foreign Office in China, got into terrible trouble with the Chinese authorities over the rights of the Kaiping Mining Company. They tried to do the dirty on, on the Chinese. They did it. They tried to rob them blind. The Chinese took them to court in London. Now, this is really important because very, very much of what Herbert Hoover actually did and very much of what is really important about the CRB has been either adulterated or whitewashed. But there's one thing that you can't do. If you've been in a court case in London, especially one that was done something to do with the empire, it will be recorded in the Times. And there it was in 1905 in the Times judiciary page before Lord Justice Joyce, Herbert Hoover, representing the, uh, the um, coal company, was lambasted by the judge for not telling the truth. Very politely, but very clearly. But who represented him in court? Richard Haldane, King's Counsel at the time, a few months away before being promoted to Secretary of State for War. Wait a minute, how can this unknown guy that we know nothing about, how can a mining engineer who's apparently very good at his job, how, how can he know all these people, all these key people that were central to my metro map? Lord Rothschild. Lord Rothschild, Natty Rothschild, a really, really interesting and, and, and generous guy in, in, and in terms of um, the history of uh, the British Jews and their entry into British society, probably the most important man, someone for whom I've got a great deal of respect. He, well, you find that Hoover's got shares in his companies and and he's doing little jobs for them. And then finally, J.P. Morgan. Can I say, ladies and gentlemen, 
if you have to, take a look at the photographs of J.P. Morgan uh, on, on Google or someplace like that. That is the most handsome photograph of J.P. Morgan I have ever seen. <laughs> he may have been a multimillionaire, but I tell you, he would never make it in Hollywood. But that's the best photograph ever. But there you are. Here's a man. He, how can this chap know and be known by all these people? And here he was, forcing himself into our narrative. And suddenly Jim and I were very aware that Herbert Hoover was in on something. What we didn't quite know was what. And here I raise, and I, I, I make no attempt at, at, at being rude, please. I do this respectfully. He was known as the Ami de Belge. At the time, he was regarded, and at the end of the war, he was regarded in the highest esteem. But the question I'm going to ask is, was he a humanitarian or was he a humbug? Which was the least offensive let, uh, name, beginning with an H, that I could find in the English language. <laughs> I, I do leave you to, to think about this and, and, and come to, to your own conclusions. The question is, who is this Herbert Hoover and how did he get into our story properly? Now, research is a great thing when you're retired and you've got the time to indulge it and uh, your wife's still working, God bless her. And um, it, was, it was great, great fun. But sometimes it becomes so absorbing that the day flashes past and you wonder, what's going on? Oh, what's this? In 1914, in August, around 40,000 American citizens were trapped in Europe. Wars declared, and I'm talking mainly about students, about teaching groups, about uh, families on holiday, um, families with relations in all various countries in Europe caught. And there was a tremendous panic. And they virtually, uh, we know the figure of 40,000 virtually immediately, wherever they were in Europe, went to London. And there was a huge pressure, an immediate pressure, in London to do something to help these stranded American citizens. Now this is a story which... Um, and, I, and there are so many characters in it. I am trying to simplify it a bit. But this is a story which sets the template, which is why it's important. With 40,000 people descending on the American ambassador uh, and the consulate in London, all looking to be repatriated in the same week in August 1914. You can imagine, it was mayhem. A group was set up, a group of uh, American uh, citizens under a guy called Fred Kent and Oscar Strauss. The two of them set up headquarters in London's Savoy Hotel. And they worked to try and register who people were, to try and find out if they could make links, if their boats would come. Obviously, people were stressed out. Then, Congress passed a bill on the 5th. 5th of August. 5th of August. As early as that. Congress passed a bill to give $2.5 million in gold immediately to be sent to London to help these stranded Americans. The idea was, we'd get you out, you can repay us later. No problem. But then some interesting things began to happen. The American, uh, his name was Robert Skinner, he, was, he had just been appointed to the, um, the embassy. He claimed what happened was that Hoover claimed that this guy Skinner had telephoned him and said, come over and help me, you're the man to help me. 
Skinner said, out of the blue, this chap called Hoover appeared and said, I'll help you. Well, it's okay, um, we've got Fred Kent and, and, and other people. Hoover went over his head to Ambassador Page. Ambassador Page says, hey, hold on, hold on. Uh, Fred Kent and, and uh, Oscar Strauss, they're looking after it. It's, it's all right, thank you. Then Hoover did something quite remarkable. First of all, he set up uh, his own committee. He convened a meeting of fellow mining engineers and had himself elected president of a group called the Residents of London for Assistance of American Travellers. He then contacted his man in Washington, Lyndon Bates, and Lyndon Bates approached parties unknown, and behold, everything began to be turned on its head. Didn't happen immediately. Wheels needed to turn. But an interesting development took place. Hoover meant business. Within 24 hours of him setting the target to be in charge of the American relief, this time of Americans, he had printed his own masthead. They had their own uh, news, the, not newspaper, writing paper. And like the cuckoo, moved in on Kent and smothered them. When the boat arrived, when the USS Tennessee arrived, it arrived with uh, the Under Secretary of War, Henry Breckinridge, got to London on the 16th of August. And Breckinridge obviously went to the ambassador. They now had two and a half million pounds to ease the problem, solve the problem, and get all the Americans home. Excellent. Hoover said, look guys, I tell you what, I've got the best organisation, I've got the best people in London, give it to me, I'll sort it out. I don't know the language that they used, but it was to the effect that go away, we're already organised. And both the Under Secretary and the Ambassador absolutely rejected his offer. It didn't stop our boy. One day later, by the evening of the 17th of August, one day later, Hoover was in charge. One day later, the ambassador and the undersecretary for war accepted that he's a man in London. What happened? How could that possibly be? Now, what we do know is when Walter Page who plays a big part in the, the story of, of Hoover, and indeed of the Belgian Relief. I'll get to that very quickly, I'm sorry. But it is a good story. Walter Page changed his attitude entirely. He, he began to speak of uh, Hoover as an American of ability who conducted the American Relief Committee with great strength. What? But this is what the official documents say. President Wilson, when he appointed Page, actually found that Page didn't want the job. He didn't want the job because ambassador to London was actually a very expensive job. One was expected to hold dinners and it was very costly. Arrangements were made through Cleveland D. Dodge of the National City Bank in New York through the government to add $25,000 a year to Walter Page's salary in order that he could be their ambassador. That is the same banker, major stakeholder of the National City Bank, financial collaborator with J.P. Morgan. The names kept popping back up. And Hoover's connections in Washington linked him to another of the shadowy men of the First World War, Colonel Mandel House. don't know if you've heard of him. He is a man that needs to be investigated very thoroughly. And lo and behold, not only, not only was Hoover put in control, but Hoover was allowed to have all his expenses that he'd previously in, in, incurred covered by them. So, 
There he was. And all because, or all thanks, to the two and a half million in gold sent to London. Now I'm going to switch. Thank you for, for allowing me to, 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 to take that little diversification. But it's important that you, you can hold on to the methodology, the support, which appears to come out of the ether, and the man himself, who is prepared to bully, and later on, I mean, when, when all of this was recorded, Hoover had dates changed. Hoover had situations removed. But let, let, let's wait for that. This famous photograph of the Committee Nationale. It didn't begin as the Committee Nationale. In Brussels, it began as the Committee Centrale. The Secure Allemand Passion in Brussels. It was headed by a very dedicated and, 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 and in many ways humble man, a uh, philanthropist and uh, multi-millionaire industrialist, in a Solvay. You may well uh, know for the, the Solvay name. And, and I have, have nothing but admiration for people who, who do try to help. And all that goes on here, I, I have no comment to make about and the in involvement. The Belgian group, Committee Centrale, realising the problems that food, the supply of food was going to have in this city, agreed to send people to London to, to, to see if they could purchase food and have it delivered, have it delivered through the good auspices of the British and German governments. Before they went, uh, one of them, uh, Danny Heinemann is, is his name, liaised with the German, uh, liaised with the German authorities. Yeah, they said it'd be fine if you're importing food for the, the starving of Brussels, we will allow that. Sir Edward Grey, Sir Edward Grey in uh, Britain said, yes, if uh, you can guarantee that that food, when it comes in to Brussels, will be monitored <coughs> and under the protection of the Spanish and the American embassies, okay, we will allow this to happen. And so, in Belgium, a group, this group, which we will look at in another way, but this group effected a very important stance in London and in Germany. But yes, they would not see the Belgian population starve. Food would be allowed to come in under these provisos. Most importantly, that of course it wasn't going to the Germans. Okay, everyone can understand the logic of that. When I started to go through this group and, and analyse it, I'm going to show you a slide which, which unfortunately appeared better on, on my computer than it does on screen here. This is taken from the final report of the CRB, and this is the Committee National de Secure Alimentation. This is their committee. Now, you'll see at the top the Spanish, the American, and in fact the Dutch Minister at La Havre. The President, Ernest Solvay. And then came a list of just names to me. If I can read out a few of them, uh, Josie Alla, uh, Ed Bunger, uh, Emil Frankie, I've heard that name before. Um, so it went on. People that I had to research individually, one by one, and then I came to Chevalier de is it Wouter Dampliter. How, how should I say that? Is that, is that fine? <laughs> Chevalier de W-O-U-T-E-R-S. Wouter? Wouter. Dampliter. And like a shaft of light hit me. Where? Where, where had, I, had I that name previous? That, that's not the name you forget, is it? 
Back to the notes. Back to 1905. Back to the court case in London. Back to the man standing in the dock beside our good friend Herbert Hoover. He was also charged standing beside Hoover in 1905 for malpractice against the Chinese. <laughs> I began to think that there might be a link somewhere. <laughs> so, what I then did was I turned this into not a list of names that were clearly problematic for me to pronounce properly, but into a list of occupations. Who were these people? Josie Allard, Bank Allard. There was a, a sprinkling of politicians of, of all parties. There was a royal envoy from King Albert. There were some lawyers. But look at the bankers. Look at the number of bankers and financiers. I mean, this one here is Frankie. Head of the Société Générale and the Bank Outre-mer. I'll have something to say about these banks shortly. But what came out from this was that this was not um, this was not a group of ordinary citizens. No one would have said they were ordinary citizens. Last night, when I challenged the professor who said that this was a group of bourgeois. Bourgeois people, which is why the values were there. I, excuse me, weren't they all bankers? Oh, no, 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 they're bourgeois. No, they're bankers. And I, I had it ready. I, I gave the list of Allard, of Philipson, of Frankie, of Jadot. And there was silence. This was a group of bankers with politicians. Now the first thing I'm going to say is that I am not saying that all of these people were not well intended. That is rubbish. Because inside the giving and inside the work that went on there were a lot of very, very good people. Especially at the level where food having, brought in, having been brought in was then dispensed. Because then you find in the communes, in the cities, in the villages, you find local groups, you find workers' groups, you find the St. Vincent de Paul Society, you find a whole cross-section of well-meaning people ensuring that this good product, this, that, that this food, is being put to good use. So I am not saying that everyone here is a scoundrel or a humbug, not at all. But I am raising questions about the connection. And there are just too many of the biggest bankers in Europe. Uh, um, you know, uh, that's uh, Leon Lambert. I'm sure there are, there are names of famous banks in there better known to you, Bank Philips and, 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 uh, and, and so on. So, and what's more, what's more, I've heard of the I've heard of the Bermuda Triangle, but never the Brussels Triangle. Because within a matter of eight months, what had happened was that suddenly the epicenter not to move, sorry, the epicenter of all that was happening was this triangle of banks from the Rue de la Loire through the Rue des Colonies, and when I saw the opulence of the former bank which was given to the CRB, given to the Americans, three floors of it, it's the most beautiful building, given to the Americans in, in order for their administration of that they needed in, in Brussels. And then it links with other banks, all together in the centre. It, it, it's, it's what, what was happening? I'm asking questions, I don't always have answers, but there are issues here which, which I think it's, it's, it's very important to, to look to. Now I don't know if you know this, 
The natural bank for Belgium was, of course, the Banque Nationale. I think it's called the NBB. Oh, yeah, okay. Now, and here's something that may surprise you. The NBB had made plans, made plans in 1912, as to what it would do in the event of war and of an occupation coming from Germany. The NBB immediately sent all its gold to London, sent all its money, pen, uh, money presses to London, because in London they had, they had their, one of their, their other subsidiary banks that they could trust, as well as the Bank of England, but there was very importantly uh, the Bank Belge pour l'étranger, which, which was actually very importantly a subsidiary of the Société Générale. When the, the Belgian economy was thrown down, was, the, when money, no one knew, what, where, where was the money going? People didn't have money in their pockets. Civil servants weren't paid, teachers weren't paid, all these pensions weren't paid. Money was hugely problematic. What happened was that the Germans, in conjunction with perhaps the most important member of the uh, CSNA in, in Belgium, um, Emil Franke, Emil Franke, who was in charge of both banks, gave to the Société Générale permission to issue currency. So there you have it. The National Bank of Belgium is in London. Currency has now been issued in Belgium, by the Société Générale. The only question that I would ask you to think about is, does anyone in the room know of a humanitarian bank where bankers put people first? It just would be such an interesting question if anyone could give me an answer. Maybe I'm, I'm hypersensitive, I, I, I don't know. But in here, of course, there was a terrible fuss about this. Terrible fuss, uh, naturally. The Germans would not allow uh, the, the royal family to go on, on, on this one. It makes sense, it makes sense, but in the, in the corner here, hasn't come up very well, but in the corner here is a, is a, a message saying that these notes issued by the Société Générale will be guaranteed as legal tender at the end of this conflict. So there should be no worry at all about using, about using this money. Emil Frankie doing very nicely out of this. It cannot be a coincidence, of course, that the most important bank, the most important man in the, uh, in the whole organisation was given such permission. Profits were to be made. However, the interconnection went deeper and deeper. What had happened now was that Societe Generale was literally given the role of the National Bank. So you have a private bank with massive assets given the role which should go to a National Bank. They could issue, and they were given the exclusive rights to issuing banknotes from December 1914 until the 20th of November 1918. <sighs> Frankie, in many ways, had become a national mediator. Inside the CSNA, Committee de Secure Alimentation, There is what I would describe as a dichotomy. Let's not get carried away with, okay, these bankers are, are making a fortune out of this because we all know that's why banks exist. But it was a symbol too. It was a symbol of Belgian 
resistance. It was a symbol because this group, which was not a legal company, it was a group of highly respected financiers, bankers, lawyers and all, all the rest of it, this group, at least resident in Brussels, gave back a certain pride because it was known that, that, that they, there were several conflicts with the German occupation um, which I think said, says quite a lot for them. However, let's take ourselves back not to, if you like, the effective workers, because the, CIA, uh, the Committee Central was powering a lot of good inside. Whatever else was happening was powering a lot of good. And the real work, which was done to help people in real need, was being done by the 130,000 volunteers and uh, assistants right across the country to help relief, to help people from starvation and uh, the horrible problems that malnutrition causes. So we must remember the good as well. But Herbert Hoover and the CRB, the Committee Commission for the Relief of Belgium, was operating in a different world. Hoover, having complete control over the international side, Hoover moved from the realm of charities, the realm of giving, into the realm of multinational borrowing. Incredibly. I, I, I just want to read you one little bit which, of which the, the, the CRB is very proud. The CRB was unincorporated, had no legal status, answerable to no shareholders, no prospectus, no annual general meeting, no business plan, no set targets. Yet, it proposed to sign up to international agreements, engage in worldwide transactions, spend sums of money which successful international banks would willingly cooperate, run its own fleet with its own flag, made claim to be American, and all done by a very clever American mining engineer. When you stop and try and imagine the complexity of such, such an organisation, you must begin to think, wait, wait a minute, how was that possible? What Herbert Hoover did was he rigidly kept control of money. And he organised on behalf of the Belgian government with its approval and through his contacts in New York, massive loans. Loans underwritten by the British, French and Belgian governments so that his corporation, it's not corporation, but his CRB, his group, was able to buy on the international market grain, foodstuffs, etc. And then with a fleet which he purchased, bring it to Rotterdam where it was by agreement to be fed into Belgium and the situation was solved. But that is not what happened. That was the theory. The practice was very, very different. And this is where the hidden history, and this is where, and why probably, people after the war didn't talk too much. It's one of the reasons why they didn't talk too much about Hoover and this work. Now, imagine, put yourself in, for a second, put yourself in, in, in the shoes of the army of occupation. Right, so food is coming in to, to, to help the, the indigenous population, fine. 
Well, that means we can requisition some of your food so to look after ourselves. In Germany, there were huge problems, especially in 1914-15, with, with food. And what was happening was that while a great amount was being sourced in America and paid for by these governments, coming through London, coming through J.P. Morgan Guarantee, coming through London to the, uh, the, the Bank Belge de l'Etranger, and, and so was the source of both the funding to buy internationally and also to pay for salaries in, in Belgium. But all of that was going on and food was coming in. A good deal was going to the Belgian population. However, matters had changed in practice. It now wasn't just for the starving. People who had money were expected to pay. And uh, I would invite you, if you haven't already visited the rather excellent um, exhibition, First World War exhibition in the Historical Museum, uh, not, not far from here. I, I was there again for the second time today. And it is an excellent, um, it's an absolutely excellent museum. What I would say, however, is try to avoid school days because there are at least 17 primary schools at once at the same time running about, having a joyous time and drawing maps and asking me questions only to discover I couldn't understand what they were saying. But hey, the museum itself, and what I would direct you is to go and look at the American Relief Shop. More later. Food was coming in, and the food was not going exclusively to the Belgian population. Now, part of me, yes? We have a factual question. So this Committee for the Relief of Belgium, was that a London-based organization, which is something else? Then there's Comité National uh, Secours et Alimentation? Oui. Okay. Wait, wait, two. And, and the, although the money was passing through London, the offices of the um, CRB, Committee, Commission for Relief of Belgium, were in 66 Rue uh, des Colonies. So the money came in in London and was then brought to Brussels? You have to remember, yes, it, it was book transactions, paper money. It wasn't gold moving from place to place. It was debt moving from place to place. There's a very subtle difference. Sorry. It began to... It began to be apparent to some of the British press that the Germans were taking some of the food. Stories were coming across. They were denied. Denied point blank in Parliament. Letters were written to the Times. That's what one does if one's in England and one wants to make a point which will... Uh, somehow or other be read by those who are important. Letters were written to the Times and were denied. In fact, the Lord Mayor of London wrote a letter to the Times and said, stop all this damn nonsense. Of course the Germans aren't taking the food. Honestly. That there was like a blank wall put up. A, 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 a thick wall between what was really happening and what people wanted to believe was happening. However, such was the volume, such was the evidence. Soldiers who had, for example, returned um, from, through Belgium back to London, because after the Battle of the Marne there was considerable numbers of soldiers stranded. And this takes me into a completely different realm, which I will not touch upon, but the, the, whole, the whole ethos and story of Edith Cavell is actually also linked into this. But I'm not going to go there in case I get asked back. Um, in January 1916, Lord Eustace Percy, you may remember I showed you one of the Foreign Office, wrote an alarming letter to Herbert Hoover about the volume of food right in this instance which had been imported to Belgium and stockpiled there with the CRB. He was much disturbed to find the large quantities of rice had been re-exported to Germany through Holland 
and sold to the Germans by the Relief Committee. Frankie assured Hoover that was nonsense, information been exaggerated. In fact, it was all apparently the fault of a private German company. Um, but this began to grow. Hoover's problem was that while he had foreign office approval to import 5,000 tonnes of rice, in this instance, between September and November, around 34,000 tonnes of rice had mysteriously come in and, and gone its way. These were, these were difficult times. Hoover began to get very annoyed, both with the British government, whom he accused of lying. Of course it's not true. And with those from uh, Belgium and Holland, who, who were clearly telling the truth. Um, it is a story which has been glossed over. In Parliament, when people ask questions, they were more or less told, no, no, you can't believe that. That's, that's, that's lies. In fact, Percy wrote a letter, which we, I can read to you a little bit, because it is, in, to my mind, from my position, a letter which fills me full of dread. He wrote to Hoover in December 1914, when the, the first of these stories was coming through, you must not let the momentary difficulties created by the action of overworked officials or elsewhere dishearten you. Neither must you feel hurt if I put to you from time to time the unfounded rumours we hear about what is happening in Belgium. I want to nail the lies as they come up, but you mustn't take any such inquiry as indicating our sympathy with you in your work is slackening in any way. Whatever appearance may be, please accept my word of honour that we only desire to help, not interfere. This, this is Lord Eustace Percy, the British Foreign Office, using words like my word of honour, unfounded rumours, nail the lies. We only desire to help. It's a letter of affirmation. It's a letter of affirmation, a promise to Hoover that the Foreign Office was right behind him even though from time to time it may have to take a different public stance. I mean, our sympathy is with you and your work. Right. I want to look at this now. I mean, I, I could, in, 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 in a chapter that's already written, I have actually put together a huge amount of evidence. But the most telling has come very recently to me. Um, in, in, in a book which I, I hadn't had access to. But it's from the German, it's the report from the German governor, um, von der Lanken. And it, it's a report which is, is in itself stunning. Von der Lanken, the German uh, political governor in, Bel in, in, in Brussels itself, his report in August 1916 says this. In spite of the supervision, now, part of the agreement was that all this food would, would come in and they would be supervised. And you know who they chose to supervise it? American students from Oxford who had won Rhodes Scholarships. <laughs> they got, no they did, they, they, they got 25 students from Oxford, some could speak French, a couple could speak German, but hey, they were Oxford, they were fine, they were fine. They were supposed to be untrained students, they were supposed to be the guarantors of everything going well. Actually, the Foreign Office had to get hold of Hoover and say, you've not got enough, you need... And how many who do you actually have? And Hoover said, well, I I, I 50. He just lied. I 50. And then he came away and admitted later, oh, my God, if they only knew that I'd only 25. And here were these youngsters. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a 20-year-old sitting in a German staff car or, 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 or being, you know, taken up the back roads because that, that road, the bridges collapsed, we can't go there. Do you imagine that they were able to actually keep tabs on where food was going. 
Lord. I want to return to von der Lanken's report of 1916. In spite of this supervision, we have once again successfully rooted an appreciable quantity of food, made use of local products for the occupying force, by means of the clauses which were kept voluntarily elastic, or thanks to arrangements contracted secretly with the neutral committee, or again with their unspoken tolerance. Another one, in another official report, he scorned the agreements with which the German Army of Occupation was supposed to operate as deliberately woolly and vague. It's not that they were woolly and vague. It's that they were deliberately woolly and vague. It wasn't the fault of the German Army of Occupation. It was the fault of those who were more or less giving them carte blanche. Claiming that the advantages that Germany gained from the work of the CRB continued to grow and grow. Now, I have somewhere uh, the most stunning of all of his, uh, of his letters. Ah, I think I know where I put it. Very difficult to keep control of so much information and, and try to make it um, coherent in, 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 in a lecture. Okay, basically, basically, von, Lanken, in, in von der Lanken, in his same or a similar report, said that the value of what was coming into Belgium and, and supporting the country, but at the same time, the other side of it flowing through to Germany, was over a million marks per week. Per week. Now, I, I, I have the statistics of the number of horses, the, the value of, of, uh, of everything from lard through to um, grains of all kinds. It would just repeat the same story. So, the question I'm going to, I'm going to jump to because I know I've spoken too long. How in heaven's name is, are all these facts hidden from us? I hope you're asking yourself, well, I didn't know that. How, 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 can, how can I know this? Where did I get this information from? Well, first of all, there were reports which at the time were suppressed. Even official reports which were suppressed, which have recently come to light and are very interesting. But also, and very tragically, I think the historian has been very, very poorly served. A great deal of fact has been deliberately, deliberately hidden from us. Buried, buried, burned, lost, or stolen. Herbert Hoover, at the end of the war, had all the records of whatever was happening in Europe, bills of lading, banking agreements, the whole, everything collected. Because... He had moved on in life from a humanitarian to a great collector of historical artefacts. <laughs> Boat loads of evidence. I'm, I'm not kidding you. You can go on and look at pictures from the Hoover Institute in America. Boat loads of evidence of, was transported from Europe, not just from Belgium, nothing like it, from all of Europe, transported to America and put into the Hoover Institute in California. That might sound... Um, oh, that, that, was going to, that, that, that might sound crazy. They're all going to read my notes, so I'm taking it off. But that's the one I couldn't find a few seconds ago, where uh, Baron von der Lanken, you know, estimé une valeur de plusieurs millions de marques par semaine. Wow. Wow. 
Okay, that's not good enough. Let me turn to burying the truth and hiding history. The other side of our research from Jim and I concerned, of course, the British story. All of this was new to me. All of this was coming at an angle I had never, ever heard of. And I'm sure we have not finished researching it. And it would be wonderful if other people began to seriously look at this, ask questions. I, I, I believe that still here in Brussels, a few years ago, maybe even right now, people asking to see original versions of um, what is now available through the internet. This is one of the, one of the books, The History of the Commission. Um, find it actually difficult to get hold of these. Hugo is approaching me um, with no real threat. Oh, he knows I'm going to be finishing shortly. Good. <laughs> What I want to say is that in the records of Viscount Grey, Lord Grey, Sir, Sir Edward Grey, British Foreign Secretary, three books of his, of his memoirs, there's no mention of Herbert Hoover. Lloyd George, who loved writing, and he loved especially writing his own name, has absolutely no mention of Herbert Hoover before America joined the war. After that, hmm, that that's all right. Lord Eustace Percy, all his records burned. Lord Milner, Lord Milner, so central to our original research and remains so central, all his records were culled and vetted. Jim and I have spent days at the Berlin Museum in Oxford. We've read dozens of the stuff that, that remains, but very, very little of it is actually exciting because it has been culled. It was culled by his wife immediately on his death. Lord Rothschild's records were burned on his instruction when he died. The papers of the Committee Nationale have disappeared. They could be in America, but I can't prove that. Tracy Kittredge, Tracy Kittredge, Mr. Tracy Kittredge, at the request of the Commission for Relief in Belgium, wrote a history, 1919. Hoover read it and said, no. It wasn't just suppressed, they actually went and they got hold of the proof copies and he ordered one of his lieutenants to get hold of the proof <coughs> copies and burn the lot. Thankfully, he didn't burn the lot because inside this story, which, is, which was the official story, we can see how, how, in particular, Hoover fell out with Emil Franke. Because, in my opinion, quite rightly, the work that was being done was in German. Every, every single benefit seemed to reflect America and America's largesse. But the work was being done in Belgium. And, in fact, all the money... All the important money was money that, in fact, Belgium would, would herself have to repay, along with Britain and France who were supporting her. In January 1917, the New York Times carried an article. I, I have a copy of it here. And it says, of $250 million spent, the United States, so innocently proud of its Belgian largesse, has given nine. That's 3.6%. And yet the image that you're sold, the story, the Walt Disney story at the start, is that charitable giving supported all of this. There's no mention of banks. There's no mention of loans on a global, international scale. But every now and then, little gems of truth come up from unexpected places. In the Library of Congress, you see in America, Whitlock's papers remain. And Whitlock talks, Brand Whitlock, the American ambassador, talks and writes about the fallout between Frankie and Hoover, at which Frankie, 
so annoyed, said, I have written a 600-page history of what has really been going on. Silence. Oh, what it took was a letter from Sir Edward Gray saying, look, we've made an agreement, it's with the Americans, you'll follow the American line. There was a, a head-to-head confrontation and Frankie banked off. Oh, how I would love to be able to read that 600-page book. What was of such importance that everything has had to be destroyed? I suspect, I suspect a great deal that wasn't acceptable. The CNSA and the CRB saved millions from starvation. Let us not for a second, and this is such a difficult thing to do in being so critical, the good work that was done was great work. But the supplies also fed the German army and nation. And can you blame them? I mean, okay, somebody's saying that that, uh, we made an agreement. But the logic of it is if there's food and you're starving, what do you do? But the net effect prolonged the war. It's one of several aspects that were going on which prolonged the war. And if you want to look at the remarkable recovery of the Societe Generale after the end of the war, my goodness, it burst out into branches across the world. Frankie was a very, very rich man. Are you confused? Do you disbelieve me? Are you angry? Can you ask yourself the question, why do you not know this? When I asked the professor last night, why? Why this wasn't taught in Belgian schools? She said, oh, well, we don't actually teach Belgian history in Belgian schools. (laughs) She said that to me. I find that. The only words I could say was, how sad. I think... There is a need. If one thing comes from this talk, if anybody can go to anyone who is a local councillor or or a a person in Brussels with authority, there are quite a few apparently, asking the question, why do we not know this? Why is this not in our school curriculum? Why is material still hidden? Are we not mature enough adults to know what happened? 